Neil Clark, editor and co-founder of Clark's World Magazine. You're, you said you're science fiction and fantasy. Uh, do you have a flavor of subgenre that attracts that you like to put into the magazine? I'm a bit of a moving target. <laughs> so, so it, you know, I'm, I tend to be looking for things that are a little bit different than what I've read before. Um, it's not that I don't like what I've read before. It's just that I get bored really easily. Uh, so, you know, this is, I think is one of the reasons that where where some of the uh, translations or, or international works or you know other uh, groups out there that might have been influenced by different writers than I have been, uh, why they may appeal to me more is that they're coming at things from a different angle. Um, so it's it's really kind of hard. There's people that like to say they know what a Clark's World story is, but I haven't been able to define it yet. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> there you have it, uh, the mystery. So you just got to write some kick butt fiction uh, and uh, and then see what happens when you send it in. Gordon Van Gelder has a process for deciding what fiction he buys. I don't know if you've heard him tell the story about how he uses it. He, he, he takes his work onto an exercise machine, and then when he forgets to keep walking on the, on the treadmill, that's a story he buys. Do you have a system sort of like that? What I tell some of the slush readers that work for us, um, I want to see the story that you remember the next day. We get 1,200 submissions a month. So yeah. it's like drinking from a fire hose. Right. And if a story stands out enough that you, it's still stuck in your head the next day, there's something special about it. And that's the, that's the one that I'm most likely to buy. Um, it's, you know, stories that might make you think or feel uh, uh, they have some sort of uh, impact that resonates. Uh, and, you know, it, it makes it a little easier when a story does that to go, yes, that's the one I need to have this. To put us in the shoes of the slush reader, then, uh, how many stories does a slush reader read in a day? They only read about five, uh, so they're they're reading less than half the uh, slush pile as a group. I think it's pretty important for me to stay as first reader on on a lot of this to keep in touch with what's going on uh, in submissions. Uh, but I tend to view the uh, the slush pile as a learning opportunity for writers and people who want to be editors. Uh, so the re- so those are the tends to tend to be the types of people I'm looking for when I bring in a slush reader, and uh, you know m- I make them do things like you know, they can't just say this story is no good. They have to give me a reason, a real reason. So it requires them to 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 think s- some more about why they're liking or disliking a story. And the deal I have with them is anything they pass up to me, um, if I don't like it, I tell them why. Um, so that they can get a better sense of what I'm looking for, what what part of a story didn't flow right for me, or you know what was that thread I pulled on that just caused the whole story to collapse. Clark's world. Do you get into uh, heated discussions between people about uh, you know somebody's in love with something, but maybe you know mm-hmm. there's some controversy about putting it in the magazine? Not so much with the slush readers, but uh, Sean Wallace, the, the uh, my partner in crime in, in, in Clark's world, um, the two of us can sometimes disagree on a story. And uh, we did this just recently where there was a story that, that he really liked. And I really liked aspects of it, but there were other aspects of it that just made me think, no, this isn't ready. Uh, and I won. <laughs> um, but... Uh, yeah, you know, there there are cases where where um, we will ha- have these discussions going on for a matter of days um, over a story. There's uh, some more uh, some of the more controversial stories we've we've published. We've actually uh, spent quite a bit of time th- thinking, can we get away with this? <laughs> so yeah, you know, there 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 is some behind the scenes stuff that goes on, and and usually it, it takes place in in uh, in a uh, in a video game. 
<laughs> what? Uh, okay, what's tell me more about that? <laughs> Sean uh, Kate, who does our podcast in nonfiction, and I uh, play. Um, destiny on the xbox oh. and we go into group chat while we're playing destiny and sometimes these stories will come up and particularly if it's one that we're in a disagreement about uh we'll talk about it there because text chat doesn't always get everything across and we're in three different states uh, there is no office for clark's world it's wherever my laptop is uh, or xbox so i'm in new jersey uh you know Kate's in Connecticut, Sean's in Maryland, uh, and then some of the slush readers are scattered all over the country and sometimes in other parts of the world. All right. So far, we haven't had much involvement from the slush readers in the group chat, but um, periodically the, there'll be a, a discussion in, in some email or or text or something like that. I like this. You're, you're kind of striking upon a, a nice little process, kind of like what Gordon uh, uh, alluded to. So you're playing you're playing Destiny, and are you guys part of the same... I, I, I don't remember... They don't call them tribes, but they call them... Clans. Clans, thank you. <laughs> so you guys are part of the same clan as well? Is that how this, this discussion starts coming up? Yeah, we set up a Clark's World clan, actually. <laughs> nice. And uh, are you in Destiny 1 or Destiny 2, by the way? Uh, both. Okay. <laughs> currently playing too, but latest update's been pretty fun. So we, we're a little distracted by that at the moment. So I'm getting farther behind. My kids are ahead of me. They're they're usually uh, playing it as fast, nearly as fast as they produce new stuff. And I'm generally I'm quite far behind. But hey, what what archetype do you uh, do you use in Destiny? Warlock. Okay, yeah. I'm a hunter or uh, huntress, as I like to say. <laughs> I mentioned to my science fiction uh, critique group that I was going to chat with you, and I said, do you have any questions for him? And of course, Tim McDaniel says, why hasn't he bought any of my stories? So if you, if you wanted to leave a... a <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you had a formal statement of that, you can go ahead and <laughs> say that. I, I think the way you qualify that question is... Yet. He writes a lot more, tends to be more of on the comedic science fiction end of things. So. Yeah, that tends to be a harder sell. Uh, though we, we do occasionally do some humor. It, I mean, uh, you know, Cat Pictures, Please was, was, was uh, by name we Kritzer, was kind of funny. And uh, this month we published a, a Suzanne Palmer story, which has got a bit of humor in it as well. But it is really hard to sell humor in science fiction because it's, it's so subjective. So there is no secret formula behind how Neil Clark selects work. I like how his process is for relaxing is to play Destiny, because that probably keeps him in touch with the pulse beat of science fiction from the more youthful perspective, because a lot of young people are playing uh, science fiction video games. About the market, audience members, do you, have you ever read a science fiction magazine? Uh, when I was young, I got uh, copies of fantasy and science fiction uh, from uh, my mother, and she picked some up, I believe they were used copies she found somewhere at a used bookstore, and uh, it was quite wonderful reading these short stories about different people in different worlds, because the type of thinking in a short story is different than that of a novel. Short stories have less risk involved from a market perspective. So authors who write short stories are really writing something that's very cutting edge or more risky from, from a market perspective. They're not investing months into writing a book about it, but instead they'll write a short story about this new idea that cropped up. So the cutting edge of science fiction is really in short stories. So I want you to think about that. And uh, if you haven't, if you're like me, and you have uh, young children, uh, there's a point in their lives where it's really high value to give them something like a science fiction magazine. This is frequently termed as the golden years or the golden age of science fiction. Now, this isn't golden age in the sense of eras, like in the era episode of Sci-Fi Thoughts. This is the best age for a child to pick up a science fiction magazine or book. 
So if you have children in your household in the 12 to 15 range and you've never given them a magazine, I prompt you to go ahead and think about that. Go get a copy of Clark's World or some any other kind of magazine and get a subscription Children are sponges at this age. Let them sponge in some of these new ideas and uh, help them develop a worldview, uh, not just just a worldview, but a galactic size view about how life and the world work. Next episode, we will talk about the proudest moment for the editor of Clark's World.